pleasure to be here at a place which at least visually looks so much like my home base of Santa Barbara, California, at least as far as the vegetation goes. Uh, the work I'm going to talk about today uh, is uh, based on joint work with uh, Stephen Hawking, Thomas Hertog, Mark Zrednicki in various uh, combinations. Um, the context for my talk is going to be the universe as a whole, uh, but I'm going to neglect quantum gravity, which is you know, not such a bad approximation any time after um, 10 to the minus 33 seconds in uh, the universe. So you can think of the universe as being a large, in a large of matter fields inside a large box, perhaps expanding, say, 20,000 megaparsecs on a side. The key thing is that everything is in there. Observers, uh, biota, stars, galaxies, um, systems being observed, and so forth. There's nothing outside, and there's nothing outside observing it. Uh, that universe has two kinds of descriptions, which I'll call first and third person uh, descriptions, I think, uh, traditional terminology. There's the third person description of, of uh, the universe, of what it's like, what occurs, uh, how, what are the galaxies in it, the particular um, kinds of physical systems uh, that it has in it, how and, uh, and how that changes over time. But in addition to that, there is the first person um, uh, description, which is uh, what we individually and collectively as human igesis, right, uh, observe about uh, the universe. And that most of my talk is devoted to the connection between these. Um, first and third person uh, descriptions are connected by the observers that make the observations. Um, science, I think, uh, I'll leave it to the philosophers to make more precise statements, aims at third person's descriptions because they're more objective. They say what's out there independent of human cognition. Uh, and in cosmology, a third person description uh, consists essentially of a statement of the dynamics, let's call it the Hamiltonian, and a statement of the quantum state of the whole box, uh, which allows us to predict probabilities for histories of what goes on inside it. But we use and test such theories by their predictions for the first person probabilities of what we observe as a particular information gathering and utilizing system uh, within the universe. Um, uh, the notion of observer and its importance for physics has changed over uh, the years. And I'll just give a brief revisionist history, revisionist, because I didn't check when I get, whether any of these things happen. I just um, uh, organized the history so it fit my argument. So <laughs> in classical physics, uh, the observer could be made essentially um, negligible. If we had a closed system, of interacting particles with an initial condition and a dynamics that predicted in principle everything in classical physics. And you could add or identify within the system an observer, which because it was small, if it was a very large system, had a negligible perturbation on the system. And therefore, the first per predictions for what was observed are the same as the third person predictions for what happened. Right. So observers and observations can be made trivial in classical physics. In Copenhagen quantum mechanics, it was in a certain sense the other way around, right? Uh, according to Copenhagen quantum mechanics, the world was divided into a quantum world and a classical one with a kind of movable boundary uh, between it, right? So if, for example, here's a little closed laboratory with a two-slit experiment going on. Uh, Copenhagen quantum mechanics would posit some kind of boundary between the experiment and the observation. The boundary could be moved, that was measurement theory, but in the end, uh, you had to have that boundary somewhere, right? Uh, and therefore, observers were part of the classical world uh, and making observations in the quantum mechanical ones, and the predictions of the theory were first-person probabilities uh, for the predictions of the theory gave first-person probabilities uh, for the results of measurements, and there was no third-person description um, 
uh, at all. Uh, so observers, unlike classical physics, were central to the formulation of Copenhagen quantum mechanics. Uh, in the, the quantum mechanics of closed systems, uh, the Evredian um, uh, view of quantum mechanics, measurements are described by third-person probabilities for correlations between different kinds of systems that are inside of the universe, uh, systems that were carrying out measurements and uh, systems that were um, um, uh, called the apparatus and systems that were being observed. It was the correlation that occurred right between those that was the result of measurement. Both were quantum mechanical, uh, and uh, both participated in this third person uh, probabilities. But again, as far as the dynamics goes, uh, the intuition that you know we're just tiny physical systems, uh, I think, held true, and therefore we have no perturbation or very little on what the probabilities, the third person probabilities for what the universe is like. <coughs> Uh, is. Um, but that's the third person probabilities. What I'm going to argue today, and it was a, somewhat of a shock to me, working, uh, having spent a fair fraction of my career getting rid of the observer in quantum mechanics, to find out that the observer returns to importance for the first person probabilities uh, for observations. And I'm not just going to illustrate that in a very simple model um, universe, which is fairly trivial. Um, these are box model universes. So we're going to think of the universe essentially at one time, and it consists of um, a lot of Hubble volumes each, uh, and they're basically two histories at one time. This history, which I'll call one, and this history, which I'll call two. Uh, these uh, Boxes are supposed to be little Hubble volumes in different places in the universe. Uh, and in this universe, all the boxes are red, think some property of the CMB. And in this universe, all the boxes are blue. Uh, this occurs according to the, the uh, third person theory with the probability P1. And this occurs with the probability P2. OK, but now we have to put the observers in because they're physical systems just like any other in uh, the universe, and they have, a, therefore, a, only a probability to exist, just like the whole universe is, have a probability to exist. So we're not very certain to, uh, we're not certain to exist, for example, in any one Hubble volume. And in a large universe, the kind contemplated by um, contemporary theories of inflation, there will be a probability for us to be duplicated at the level of the coarse graining that we're described. So I'm going to model this by a very simple model where I'll just assume that there's a probability PE for an observer like us to exist in any Hubble volume. Uh, and th that's the same for all of them. That's a very crude model. So the observer only has one degree of freedom, but it's enough for the discussion. So that's more re realistic in birth than most. And so we might have, for example, an observer in this volume, but uh, then it might be duplicated. It's a kind of frightening prospect when you think about it. <laughs> but there's some evidence that it might be true, right? Because um, you know, I've only been to a few meeting of quantum mechanics conferences, but Dave has been at every single one. <laughs> so there are two explanations. One is that he goes to a lot of conferences, and the other is up there before you. At any rate. That probability PE includes the probability for 3 billion years of biological evolution. We're not going to calculate that anytime soon, if ever. And therefore, I have to address this issue. So, but let's first uh, do the math here and get the um, uh, third person probabilities for history. So a history is defined by the red boxes or the blue boxes. And then what's the configuration of observers in each? So in this particular configuration, there are, observ there are four observers in various boxes. So the probability for this to occur, that is, uh, is the probability for the first history to occur, and then four times PE to raise to the fourth power for the four observers, and no observers in the other two boxes like this. And more generally, there's a formula like this that gives you the probabilities uh, in this little model for how many observers occur, which is the whole con configuration. Um, 
Now the question is, what's the first person probability that we see a particular thing in the universe that we observe red? Uh, so I'm going to assume, which I'll come back to this assumption uh, later, that we're equally likely to be any of the inci incidences of uh, E. After all, with this level of description, there's nothing to distinguish them. Um, the probability that we see red, for example, is the probability that uh, we're in the history with the red boxes. But that probability is not the, the, uh, the third person probability that the red boxes occur because they could occur with no observers. Therefore, the probability, rather the probability that we see red is proportional to the probability that um, the red boxes occur with at least one observer, a set of observer of this kind in it, because that's all we know. We don't know how many other observers there are. Uh, the first person probability that we see red, therefore, is, uh, if we want to calculate the probability that there's at least one ob observer, is one minus the probability that there are no observers, is one minus the probability that there are no observers in a, a given box raised to the power of the number of boxes. So the probability that we see red is proportional to the probability that the red uh, universe occurs multiplied by this additional, what we call, top-down factor. And that is, um, that factor can be significant, as I will show you, and that is basically the return of the observer into um, quantum cosmology. So let's look at this uh, formula. Here it is repeated again. Uh, when we're rare, suppose, for example, the number of Hubble volumes, PE is very low, and the chances are that there's uh, at most one of us. Then this reduces, as you can see from the little expansion, the probability that we see red is n1, the number of boxes, times the probability that one occurs, and the same for two. So this is what's called volume weighting, right, for the probabilities, but it's automatic when you calculate the probabilities for observer. So it could be that, for example, the probability for the blue boxes to occur is larger than the probability for the red boxes. But red will be more likely to observe when uh, n1 times p1 is bigger than n2 times p2, as you could even whatever you could clearly arrange by picking n1 and n2 uh, carefully. What is most probable to occur is not necessarily in cosmology, what's the most probable thing to be observed? That is the major message of the talk, and that's the return of the observer. Uh, just to continue on a little bit with the limits, when we're, when we're common, that is, uh, the number of, of Hubble volumes is so huge that, the that we occur many times in the universe, then uh, this factor here, when this goes to infinity, uh, we just get no top-down weighting whatsoever, and we're back in uh, uh, the usual situation. And the common limit probabilities for what we observe agrees with probabilities for uh, what occurs. So, but there's a question here. Have we somehow succeeded uh, in uh, having a better analysis but reduced our ability to compute? Since I don't think we're going to compute anytime soon. Uh, so, whoops. Computing the probability that we exist is billions of years of biological evolution is in principle possible in physics, but uh, it's not going to be realized anytime soon. But there are these two limits uh, where uh, we're very rare, in which case uh, we get volume weighting and it does become computable, or we're very common and it does. So we can stick those. You want some intermediate case, you've got to do a lot of work, uh, launch some project like this. It's not unlike statistical mechanics in this qualitative aspect. We can simulate, of course, a box of gas with, say, 1,000 particles in it or 10,000 particles. But if it's 100,000 particles, it becomes an uh, intractable uh, problem, right? But there are limits, a very large n, right, in which we do get predictions because of notions like, uh, like the approach to equilibrium. So here, too, you don't get predictions everywhere, but you get enough predictions uh, to do something. So that's the story so far, but I snuck one thing in to you, namely, this is just a repeat of an earlier slide with some part of it blown up, 
I assume that we're equally likely to be any of the incidences of E, and that's a typicality assumption. So it's an additional assumption in the theory uh, to connect uh, what's observed to what um, we see. So Mark and I call this, uh, in general, the, we don't have to have uh, typic, that is, typicality doesn't have to be uh, assumed. We can assume, as part of the theory, uh, any distribution that would um, uh, connect uh, the third person and first person probabilities. And then that becomes a testable part of, um, part of the theory. Uh, we call that the zero graphic distribution. Um, so H and Psi predict the third person probabilities for how many instances of us there are. But if we're duplicated, to get from the third person probabilities, we have to assume something about the probability that we're any one of those incidences that occurs in the third person formulation. And that's the zero graphic distribution. Uh, it's a combination of these, as I just said, that's testable by experiment. So experience is first person, physics is third person. Um, the second speaker, I think, for me, I believe, will tell you that Born's rule dies. I'm here to assure you that Born's rule is alive and well for third person probabilities. Uh, if you had the zero graphic distribution, of course, you don't, that's another thing. But for the usual sort of story in physics, it's fine. Um, now, many people have principles for what the zero graphic distribution should be. That is, for example, that it should be typical. We should assume we're typical of any such instances. And um, that, uh, that's OK to have such principles, but it would be better, I think, if we just allowed the to vary and uh, figure out what's uh, the best one. Um, and it's risky. For example, we might take the solar system, and it, let's assume we're typical observers in the solar system. Then I think arguably we predict, since Jupiter is very much bigger, that there are no observers on Jupiter. But we don't know that. Maybe they're up there in the clouds or something like that. Uh, the assumption is risky because we have no experimental evidence whatsoever of whether we're typical or not. All right, so a principle may be, but it risks conflict with experiment. So here's a case where assuming typicality led to a lot of predictability that we probably don't want. Um, well, this just says that, no experimental. Another case is Boltzmann brains. Right. Um, I'm sure everybody here is somewhat Bolt, Boltzmann brains, um, is familiar with it. Uh, it could be in addition to us ordinary observers that uh, have a history that far in the future of the universe, or maybe even <coughs> a little bit now, uh, there are va <coughs> vacuum fluctuations or thermal fluctuations uh, that fluctuate into existence that have exactly the same data uh, that we do. Uh, I hasten to say I don't think anybody has the slightest idea how to compute anything like that, no matter what they tell you. Right? Um, so, uh, if we can assume that, if we assume that we're typical of all those brains, here we are down here at 13.7 giga years, that's us, and then there's all this stuff up here which uh, fluctuates into, into existence. We can assume we're typical. Uh, in that case, we got no, pr no predictions. I think. But we can assume a zero graphic distribution <coughs> that uh, we're equally likely to be any of the brains less than, say, 100 giga years away. Then you get cosmology uh, as usual. I think it's necessary in science to assume that you're not diluted. And the zero graphic distribution appropriately chosen gives you a mechanism to do that. So this is the story so far. Um, we have predi predictions uh, for l large scale behavior in the universe occurs is little influenced by the presence or absence of observers. But the predictions for the, um, large, what large-scale behavior we observe depends significantly on uh, how many observers there are and what is most probable to, um, to exist is not necessarily what's most probable to observe. So I'm going to rest, devote the rest of the talk to giving uh, uh, three examples <coughs> where this difference is significant. Uh, and these are all based on the no boundary wave function, uh, because that's the thing I've computed the most. 
here it is. I've just written it, uh, just we'll write it down very schematically, right? Just including geometry and no matter. Uh, wave functions in cosmology are functions on the configuration uh, space of three geometries and three matter field configurations. Uh, so a wave function is a function of a three geometry. And roughly speaking, it's given us by a certain sum of e to the minus action, right? The usual action of quantum mechanics for the four geometries evaluated over, uh, over four geometries which have one boundary on which uh, matches the three geometry and the argument of the wave function and otherwise has no other boundary. That's why it's called the no boundary for post. Um, I'm only going to be working the semi-classical approximation where you think of the sum as an integral. Uh, it's dominated by, uh, it, would be, it would be dominated by one saddle point of the action. Those saddle points are in general complex. And so roughly speaking, the, the uh, wave function is given by e to the minus the value of the saddle point uh, at the extremum. And here's a typical classical, uh, not classical, but it, it's a well-known picture of a saddle point in which you have, uh, it's complex because you have a Euclidean geometry down here with no boundary, which is a uh, part of a four sphere evolving up here into this inner space, um, uh, connected across this boundary, uh, or matched across this boundary. Let's see. So I'm going to assume, uh, to keep on with simplicity, I'm going to assume many super, the simplest mini superspace model, so I get to discuss this. Homogeneous, isotropic, and closed configurations, and I'm just going to assume one scalar field. So the metric looks like this uh, minus dt squared. And then there's a scale factor here, a familiar form. I don't need to say much about that here at a conference on cosmology. And um, then we have some fields, because they're homogeneous, they're a function of time. I'm assume, I'll assume a potential, which is, has got a cosmological constant, and say just the quadratic potential in, in, in phi, characterized by some mass m. The wave function is then a function of the scale factor and the homogeneous fa value of the scalar field. And in the semi-classical approximation, it's given by um, uh, this, right, where this is the action of typical saddle points. The saddle points in general are complex, and I'm going to introduce a parameter, uh, phi naught, right, to label the, the, their whole set of different saddle points. Turns out there's a one-parameter family, and I'll just label it by the value of phi at the south pole, the absolute value. So let's talk about the third person predictions for classical histories, which is what we're concerned with most in, in cosmology. Uh, because the saddle point is complex, the wave function, the action will have a real part and an imaginary part. And this is just WKB, right, in ordinary quantum mechanics. So using the WKB results, so to speak, when uh, the action S varies rapidly, the imaginary part varies rapidly compared with the real part, then we predict an ensemble of classical histories, which are the integral curves of S. That is, there's the solution to the hamilton jacobi uh, relation that connect the menta, momenta, which have d variables dt, to the gradient of uh, Vs, of, of S, two equations, uh, so that already by this relation, which connects momenta to position, uh, the phase space, right, which of, in this case is four-dimensional, is halved, and that's why such wave functions are predicted. Right? We don't predict every classical history, but only some of them. And the probability is the square of the wave function, e to the minus 2 i r. Uh, so my first example is slow roll inflation. Uh, it turns out that all the classical histories inflate, but they have different, um, different in this model, but they have different amounts of inflation. So we have this one parameter family of classical histories uh, with third person probabilities, which uh, computed is on the previous slide, uh, which I'll give as p phi naught. And so once we have the histories, of course, we can calculate how much slow roll inflation there is in them. Uh, the probabilities look like this. Remember, they were proportional to e to the minus i r. And so the probabilities go down for larger phi naught. But the number of e-folds that we compute by looking at each cl classical history, this is an ensemble with different values of n, right? Uh, the things that inflate the most are the things with the least no-boundary probability. 
But those are the first person prob probabilities. So assume we're rare, and now calculate the probability for what we, what we observe. Right? Then we have to weight by volume, right? roughly speaking, because uh, vi larger volumes, because if, if we're a quantum mechanical system ourselves, there's a probability to exist, and there's a greater probability to exist in a large universe where there's more places for us to be. So this was the old result. We multiply by the volume, e to the 3n, and the probability goes back up. So it tends, at least if you have cutoffs down here, which I won't describe, it tends to favor slow roll inflation. So by itself, the, the no boundary wave function favors low inflation, but we predict what we observe is, uh, is inflation. because So the question, is it probable that our universe inflates, is not possible to answer, right, unless you say what kind of probabilities you're talking about. Inflating universes are not the most probable to occur on the basis of H and psi, but they're the uh, most probable to be observed because we're part of the system and there are more places for us to have fluctuated into existence, if you like, in a large universe than in a small one. Second um, discussion is eternal inflation. Uh, I see Tom cringing back, back there, but I'm just going to give the usual story, and I'm going to blame the other people for this. Um, well, let's see. It's unfortunate he's here, but it's lucky Thomas and Stephen aren't here, right? Because uh, I'm going to talk about a model landscape which just has one scalar field. The string la landscape is not like this, but it's sort of uh, it's useful. So this universe has many different minima separated by the potential, separated by big potential barriers. So. For example, if you take the cosmological constant, which is the vacuum energy, if you look down near one of these minima, there are different values of the cosmological constant. There are also different values of the, of the, um, of the quadratic term, and that you can even have different powers. So that giving, if you're in such a potential, that's a mechanism for the constants of nature to vary. Because the probability that we observe one set of parameters or another is turned into a historical question. Did we roll down this slope, or that slope, or some other slope to the bottom? Uh, and the first person probabilities um, then tell us what is most likely for us to observe. Um, now, eternal inflation, I can't really do anything here about, the, about it here, but I'll just tell you the, the story. People calculate, I don't think the calculations are all that great, but uh, they, I hope I'm not offending somebody in here, but the, the end result is that fluctuations that leave the horizon, that this is uh, reasonably solid, during a regime of, of eternal inflation, which I haven't characterized for you exactly, in a certain regime of phi naught, uh, become very large, right? So the universe gets very large and it gets very inhomogeneous. Uh, and for example, e that occurs even in m squared phi squared, where we are rolling down, there's a regime of eternal inflation above basically one over the square root of the mass, right? And if something starts up here and starts to roll down, it, um, uh, it uh, becomes very big. But now to get to the, um, get to the first person um, probabilities, we have to wait by these top-down factors, which are this. Um, this shows that, for example, if, uh, if we have something that gets very big, then this factor is one. If we start below this, so the universe remains small, then it's going to be proportional to PE. So the small universes are suppressed by the probability for us to absolve. And, and the most probable first person uh, history occurs at the lowest exit from eternal inflation. And that is, um, oh, I heard this says the same thing. Histories with no EI are suppressed. Histories with EI are dominated by the lowest exit. So we're left with a, a predicted ensemble. And then that, that's predicted here. Predictive here, for example, is a calculation not done by me, but by Thomas Hertog. Uh, he took as a little model landscape uh, the potentials that are, the, so there's no theoretical motivation for this, but they took the, the potentials that are, were used to reduce the Planck data. Right, which are here. They took, uh, compared phi to the two thirds, r squared inflation, phi, phi squared, and phi cubed, and used that as a little ensemble of potentials. 
and then calculate what the scalar to tensor ratio, and we would observe, and it comes out down here. So if that was the ensemble, and that was the prediction, and bicep were correct, we would be out of business. But of course, it's possible it could also be turned around. So either the no boundary wave function is incorrect, or the ensemble is not like that, or the observations are wrong. Uh, my main point is that it has something to do. Finally, I want to talk about the dreaded A word, anthropic selection. Um, every prediction for an observation in cosmology is what I would call anthropic. That is, uh, it, because it's conditioned on a description of the observational situation. It doesn't make any sense to ask from the third person theory, what is the probability of the temperature of the microwave background? Because it varies with time you have to put in the information of where you're making the observation. Right? And anthropic means, since this is the factor, we won't observe what is where we cannot exist. Because if P equals zero, then this whole factor is equal to zero. So anthropic reasoning, people devote a lot of heat to this, is, um, does not require a principle. It's not an option. It just follows automatically. From, and it does not change the objective nature, I think, of the third person theory. It's just um, an automatic consequence of treating observers as though they were physical systems within the universe and not somehow, and calculating probabilities for their observations. Uh, here's an example, uh, the cosmological constant and uh, Q. Uh, a little history, Weinberg showed a long time ago that um, did a, this kind of calculation with just letting uh, lambda vary. Levy and Reese showed that the calculation got worse, right, if you allowed, for example, the amplitude of the density fluctuations to vary. Uh, and so here they are, here's a plot, and they're anthropic constraints, right? We didn't do these, we just took them from Tegmark and company. But they have the simple you know, ground rule. If, um, if you have, this is basically a plot of PE, um, that is the probability to exist. Uh, let's see, very roughly, for example, your given scale of fluctuations, and you make lambda bigger, then you don't get any galaxies because the universe expands too quickly and nothing collapses. Well, okay, we need galaxies. If you are a given value of lambda, right, if the fluctuation amplitude is too big, you get a universe dominated by black holes, and if it's too small, you don't get collapse by, so we're putting in the time by 11 giga years. So. So you put those uh, three things in, and you get this following constrained um, reason, region. Now, usually what is done is to put in a uniform prior on that and then calculate the value of lambda and q. That would give you actually something that disagrees a little bit up here. But uh, we have the prior. It's given by the no boundary wave function. So it's more interesting to put that in as a probability, uh, and then on this uh, restricted reason and seeing what you get. And the probability for lambda n, I'm not going to attempt to buy this, derive this, turns out to be proportional to the e to the pi lambda uh, divided plus m over 2, where m remembers the mass of the scalar field. And that turns out to be roughly e to the pi, 2 pi over q. It's, uh, I think, fairly simple origin. The no boundary wave function is e to the minus action. Fluctuations cost action, therefore, uh, uh, they will be uh, suppressed. So this favors low value of the fluctuation. And if you put this as the prior in this allowed region, you get this red dot here, which gives you a marginal uh, distribution for lambda, which is basically dead on, and is essentially right at 10 to the minus fifth. Of course, we put in a lot of stuff, like uh, the age and so forth. But um, and I'm not claiming in any sense that that's general, but um, uh, it looks good for this particular simple example. So the landscape provides a mechanism for the parameters and varies. Anthropic reasoning is their necessary consequence of realistic models of observers. That's it. Here are my main points once again. Um, observers are physical systems within the universe, and they have no special role in the formulation of quantum mechanics. But they have probabilities to exist in any Hubble volume and to be replicated elsewhere in very large universes. Theories of the universe's um, dynamics and quantum state predict third-person probabilities, 
for what occurs, including whether there are any observers or not, since we're, we're just one special kind of fluctuation in the universe, um, and whether there are observers or not, and how many of them are, there are that are like us. A first person probabilities for what we see needs a typicality assumption, a zero graphic distribution connects these to the third person probabilities, and what is most probable to be observed is not necessarily what is the most probable to occur. And first person probability is automatically anthropic because we won't observe where we, cannot, uh, where we cannot exist. Thank you very much. All right, we have time for questions. Tom, and you're supposed to say your name and speak into the microphone. Okay, Tom Banks. Um, Jim, I didn't see anywhere in your discussion a mention of the time at which these probabilities are measured or predicted to be. And one of the big issues for people who talk about eternal inflation is the question of the fact that you can choose different space-like surfaces in this incredibly complicated universe that eternal inflation is supposed to produce and that you get different results for asymptotic probabilities for a large time, depending on how you make that choice. So does your proposal resolve any of that? It does not, right? So I'm assuming a very simple model where I'm treating the fluctuations, in fact, as small. We're on the reheating surface, right? Having also said just before that that they're very big and the surface will be very wiggly. So basically what we try to do in that case is to go directly to the first person probability by coarse graining out all the large structure uh, that um, uh, we have. And so then it reduces, if our coarse graining discussion is correct, but there are plenty uh, to just the usual case where there are not so many, um, uh, it's not such a big irregularity, but at that particular lowest exit from eternal inflation. But I agree with you. I don't much like the calculations that they're done. I think they're unreliable. They're partially classical. And, uh, but um, how to put it? Uh, in this world, you just can't calculate everything yourself from the beginning, right? And so I took uh, what these people said, simplified it, and that's the result. Thank you. Pretty good. Uh, let's get Luke. Hi, Luke Barnes. Um, this zero graphic distribution, I'm, I'm struggling to understand if there, are, if there are no constraints on that at all, then you can create any connection you like between any third person probability and any set of observations. So you've, you've totally disconnected theory from observation, right? I mean, well, let, let me summarize the question. Is what is the zero graphic distribution about? What is it a fact about? If, it, if it's just a fact in my head, then I can do whatever physics I like, surely. It's nothing special. It, it's not something peculiar to quantum mechanics. Uh, if there was a conference going on with a better speaker in the room and you were duplicated or had a probability to be one or the other, you could calculate that probability. It's true it introduces a new element of uncertainty, but uh, it's... Um, required, I think, by the fact that uh, uh, as physical systems we might be observed. So people have different principles for it, as I mentioned. Some people think it should be typical. But, you know, the third, would you say there's a, a constraint on the third person theory? I think you're allowed to propose any theory you want and then compete them against each other. And the same is true with the zero graphic distributions as part of the system. More question? Obviously, yeah. I would like something that's simple, like all equally likely or something like that. Yeah, hi. Uh, so this is Bob Wald. I think we know each other. Yes, indeed. Uh, so and I I'm guess I would say- I'm trembling in my boots up here right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I, I think there is not a single factual assertion that you've made in the talk that I would disagree with. Right. Uh, here we but go. it seems to me that, in, that you know, in this, uh, uh, Viewpoint. I mean, uh, I mean, it's a valid viewpoint. Everything is going to hang on probabilities of observers, and if you know, if a, if an observer is sort of defined vaguely and generally like any conscious object, we don't have the slightest idea what that is. We don't have the slightest idea what any of the probabilities are, and we uh, 
we uh, can't really predict anything. On the other hand, if we now start saying, oh, well, you know, life as we know it uh, is the usual phrase I hear, not from you, but, you know, so, you know, carbon, and then we have, ga have to have galaxies and that. I mean, the more you put in, the better your theory is going to do. And now if, if I say I want, you know, me as the observer uh, here in this universe, and of course I've read, uh, well, I actually haven't, but I can pretend that I've read the latest FizzRev letters and that sort of thing. If I put all that in, the probability of having an observer who has read the latest papers on the CMB and so on, whatever my theory is, I'm going to get a wonderful job. I'm going to get curves that are even better than your no boundary curves for the cosmological constant uh, and all that. So, I mean, where, where does one learn anything? While I agree that every, just to tie my remarks together, while I agree that everything that you're saying is in some sense correct and we really do need to, to you know, modify our probabilities by the existence of observers, I, I would agree that with that in principle. I, I can't see where that gets one. I think one can either go to one extreme and have no predictions because you don't know what consciousness is, or you can go to the other extreme and get our universe out and claim a great success of your theory. Okay, let me, um, let me just make a general remark and see if this helps. At any one time, approximately in cosmology, we have all the data uh, we can think of now. So we have to start on a program. We divide the data into two pieces, part of which we assume and part of which we seek to correct. The theory is more successful if it predicts correlations uh, between different pieces of our data, which we, so we calculate all possible cor uh, correlations, some like you say, which are completely trivial, then we need a judge to tell us which ones are significant, like you, saying that's no good, the fact you've got probability one for assuming the fizz rev and predicting uh, the value of the temperature of the microwave background. It has to have, they have to be interesting correlations, and then we compete the theories on the basis of what um, interesting correlations they have. But I don't see any escape uh, at a realistic level if you're going to talk about if our data is from, comes from observations, of putting in a description of the observational situation. Time for a couple more questions. Uh, Simon Saunders, um, I'm not sure if my question is only echoing um, Bob Walls, but um, do I understand you right that you're getting rid of the Boltzmann brains in the remote Sorry. future because you're essentially restricting to veridical observers, if I can put it like that? I, I, so so I, I would agree. So the, it's more interesting if stuff is independent of observers, right? But it looks like here, right, if we put in the simplest possible fact just that they exist, right, we get a significant effect on certain quantities. So you're free to um, not put them in, and then I think the theory won't have very much to say. No, 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 I, I was speaking specifically about ver veridical observers, observers that are not deluded as to their actual situation in the universe. Yeah. So. I would like to get rid of those by... Right, and is uh, that a, is that, does that summarize, in a sense, the, the strategy? That's one, cer right. certainly one part of it. I would sort of advocate some, uh, something that says we're not deluded. For example, in our measurement of the age, right. we're not imagining right. that. In that case, we're at 13.7 right. right. giga years, and there are very few Boltzmann brains around here. Right. Right. Some, Good. you still should calculate the probability, I guess, that we're Boltzmann brains at 13.7. So, um, so yeah, it's just a new dimension of the theory that hasn't been, I think, completely explored, but a necessary one in, um, to be realistic in cosmology, whatever the fallout. An excellent place to end. Let's thank Jim again. Mm -hmm.